Hey, well, good morning, and it's Super Bowl Sunday, so in honor of Super Bowl Sunday, I thought it'd be kind of fun to break out my, uh, my football jersey, and since I don't have anything that's Chiefs or Bucks, not that I would wear it anyways, I, I went Raiders, so go Raider Nation. Um, so uh, a few things I want to announce before we get into the message this morning. One is just a reminder that on Sunday mornings, we have, good, we have um, worship on the lawn services at 1045, weather permitting. What's amazing is last Sunday was eight months in a row that we've been meeting outside and we haven't missed a Sunday. You know, God has blessed us with, with windows of good weather and we are grateful for that. And we have a wonderful time and we hope you'll join us. If you can't make it, we're just glad that you're um, taking advantage of watching the messages online. The second thing I'd say is coming up on February 21st, um, we're starting to do a thing called Good Food, Good Company, where once a month, just after church, we're going to have um, lunch outside on the lawn. I'm just looking for ways during this time where we don't have a lot of our small groups and other ministries going on, finding ways for people to connect. I feel like we keep collecting people, but it's hard to connect people during this time. And so we're just providing lunch. And kind of a cool thing is that this lunch is going to be catered by, um, by Gypsy Flame. And the owner of that happens to be the guy that myself and somebody else um, pulled out of the water a few weeks ago. And... Um, part of saving his life or whatever it is. I don't know how you'd phrase that. It feels weird to even say that. But, um, but anyways, we've developed um, some communication since then. And so super excited that he's going to be here to provide that. And so, um, so anyways, just um, want to invite you to that. It's only $5 a person, and you get pizza and, um, and salad and beverage. It's going to be a great time. The third thing I mentioned, not so much announcement, but in Scripture it says, that we should carry one another's burdens. And there are a lot of things that are burdens in life, and, and none, none is more probably more difficult than dealing with just um, when a person's health declines quite a bit. And that's been the case with Dick French. And so I know a lot of you have been praying for Dick and Linda French um, in recent days as he's dealt with cancer. And that's, um, to make a long story short, there's a lot of other complications in addition to, to that, to cancer. And so um, they've invited hospice to come in, and um, they're at that point in the journey. He's going to be returning home on Monday. Um, I say that one so you'll be aware and be in prayer. The other is we're just inviting people to send cards to them. If you don't have their address, send it to the church, and we'll make sure that we get it to, um, to Dick and Linda. Some have already been doing that, and um, Linda shared that that's really a source of encouragement. And so um, we can't fix each other's problems, but we can help carry the burden along the way. And so please keep them in your prayers and, and try and find ways to encourage them as well. So kind of hopping into the message a little bit this morning, uh, the message is called The Right Way to Treat People. And we're um, continuing our study of the book of James. And somebody once said a long time ago that to dwell above with those you love, oh, now that will be glory. But to dwell below with those we know, well, that's a different story. And, and maybe someday there comes a time, you know, in the great, you know, great beyond where you know, where we get along and everything is perfect and harmonious. But, you know, in this life, there's going to be conflict. You dance with each other long enough, you're going to step on each other's toes. And we've got to find a way to, to be able to, um, to get along. And, and you can do a lot of um, really good and godly things, but if you can't do relationships well, then kind of what's the point? I was thinking about what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 2. He said, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love... I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. And, and, and like I said, we can do a lot of good and even godly things, but if we can't treat people right, then what's the point? Um, Jesus even told his disciples, they will know you're my disciples by your love. And, and um, the passage we just looked at last week, was, you know, talked about just do it, you know, and, and we need to get rid of the moral filth in our life, but the Christian life is more than just don't do it. It's also just do it. And, and, and at the top of that list is that we need to do relationships in a way that honors God and honors others. And so this morning, this section of Scripture, James immediately focuses first and foremost on relationships. Because all that other stuff doesn't matter if we don't know how to do relationships well. And so I want to look at a, just a few things this morning, different aspects where we need to really think about how to treat people right. And, and so in James chapter 1, verse 26, we're going to start there and work our way through this passage. But in James chapter 1, verse 26, 
He writes, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Now in a few weeks when we get to chapter 3, we're going to talk a lot more specifically about controlling the tongue because James has probably one of the best sections of scripture uh, focusing on our speech. So I'm not going to spend as long on this right now. But the point I want to say this morning is that if we want to treat people right, then we need to be careful what we say. If we want to treat people right, then we need to be careful what we say and how we say what we say. And James says, if we consider ourselves to be religious, we need to keep a tight rein on our tongues. And this is the first of back-to-back verses where he says, if somebody claims to be religious, then this. If they claim to be religious, then this. So if we claim to be religious, we need to keep a tight rein on our tongues. Um, and it's interesting if we claim to be religious, and the word religion is, is kind of taking a lot of hits in recent days, not just from people outside the church, but people from inside the church. Um, and it's become kind of trendy even among Christians to say, well, I'm not about religion, I'm about a relationship with God. And I, I think it comes from a misunderstanding of what true religion really is. And um, the word religion actually means to connect or to bind. And, and so the idea of religion is, is having habits or practices or way of doing life that helps us connect or bind with something. And as far as of Christ, it's to help us to connect or bind ourselves with Christ, with God. And, and so there's certainly nothing wrong with the word religion. It's a biblical word. And, and I would go so far to say that, that yes, you can have religion without being, you know, without having a relationship with God. And we need to be careful about having habits and things like that, but not having a relationship. But the other side of it is, if you have a relationship with God, there are going to be religious habits that are part of our life as well. But he does contrast it, and Jesus did the same thing. Those who say they're religious and those who actually are. And it's not what they say, but it's what they do. And specifically, it's how they treat others. And you can tell somebody if they're really religious by the things that come out of their mouth. And nothing creates more conflict and, and uncertainty and calls into question the authenticity of our faith than if we speak you know, harsh words or hurtful words to others. And you see this these days, and sometimes you know, you know, there's Christians that sometimes we're, we're so convinced that we're so right, but we don't speak kindness as we deal with different issues. And we do need to be able to speak to different issues, but sometimes the way we communicate is hurtful and harmful and doesn't resemble Christ at all. And, and if we're truly religious, if we're truly connected or bound to Christ, then we need to think about what we say and how we say it. We need to think about what we post you know, as well, the things that come out of our mouths and the things that come out of our fingers as well. And James says it's not enough to say that we're religious or connected to God. We need to show it. And one of the ways we do that is by keeping a tight rein on our tongues. Now the next point. Let's go on to verse 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Here's the next point. If we want to treat people right, we should care well for orphans and widows. If we want to treat people right, we should care well for orphans and widows. And throughout Scripture, God places a high premium on caring for those who can't care for themselves very well. And in that culture, if you were an orphan, a fatherless child, you know, and, or, a, or a, a widow, you couldn't really care well for yourself. You are, were often dependent upon somebody else to take care of you. And, and so James says, we need to make sure that people like this don't fall through the cracks. And, and it's gotten a little bit easier to, um, to, to maybe be a widow in this, in this culture, but it's still got a lot of challenges, aside from loneliness, just even the, the financial and the logistical challenges that go with that. And um, I want to talk about the first group of people first, about orphans, caring for war orphans. Currently, there are about 132 million orphans in the world. I don't know if you caught that. Currently, there are about 132 million children in the world that don't have parents that are part of their life. You know, and... Um, and thinking about the way people, you know, care well for, for, for children in that scenario, I, I got to I have this tremendous admiration for those who foster or adopt children. The last church I was at, there was um, a ministry we had out of the church, you know, where 
there were foster families that would come together twice a month, and, and it was amazing. And we had a lot of people in the church who were foster parents, and we had students that were, were, were foster kids. And, and I just have so much admiration for that, you know, and, and um, incredible ministry. In fact, on any given day, there are nearly 428,000 children in foster care in the United States alone. And, and, and so that's one of the ways that sometimes people minister and care for, you know, for orphans. And another is, you know, some people, even within the foster care system or outside of it, get adopted. There's currently about 7 million Americans who have been adopted at some point in their life. That's a big number. 7 million Americans at some point in their life, somebody adopted them. Now, not everyone feels called to foster family ministry or adopting, but there are a lot of other ways that we can care well um, for, for orphans, you know, and, and there's a lot of great ministries, you know, World Vision and my in-laws have another ministry to Africa, and there's a, a number of different ways that you can sponsor a child. Um, sometimes another way is just finding, finding avenues or ministries to, to, to provide encouragement or care um, for those who are in this situation. Um, let's talk about the second group of people. He also says that true religion is those who care also for widows. Currently, there are about 13.6 million widows in the United States, and of all kinds of different ages, young and old and in between. 13.6 million. I thought this was interesting, too, in the same article I was reading. About 700,000 women become a widow each year. On average, they survive about 14 years after that. So it's 14 years after that, after their spouse passes away, that they're still around. You know, and I know that we're in a culture that's where widows are, are a little bit better positioned to be able to make it, but you know, there's still all the financial issues of being on a, a fixed income or a, you know, or, or single, you know, income. Um, not to mention just the, the loneliness and things like that as well. And we need to make sure that we care well for those who are widows. And it's not just all ladies, sometimes it's men, but it can be incredibly lonely. You know, I think we all have people in our lives who are navigating that season of life. I watched my, my dad when my mom passed away a few years ago, and it's a different journey. You know, he shared, you know, I never thought that, that, that it, I'd be at this place in, in, in my life. You know, I thought things would look very differently. You know, I think I'm talking with, you know, Linda French, you know, just hours ago, you know, about, about what's going on with them and stuff. You know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's hard, you know, and my heart breaks for um, people that are going through that. And, and so we, um, we do a great job of coming together for funerals sometimes, but we need to also be there for people in the days that follow as well. Um, you know, I, I, I would say this, not just the, the widows, but also sometimes the elderly is, is I think there's just another side ministry of that. And there's a lot of people who care for, for their parents as they get older. And, and that's an incredible ministry as well. Um, that's pure religion. You know, that really is a ministry. And um, even if you love your, your parents, when they reach that point in life, it still requires, uh, you know, a lot of time and energy and even sacrifice on people's parts to either care for them um, in their home or sometimes to make sure that they're cared for, you know, at a facility that will take good care of them as well. Um, but even if you're not in that position, you know, we need to make sure that we make sure that, um, that, that people are cared for well. So ask yourself, you know, how are you doing, you know, in terms of caring for you know, children without parents or the elderly or, or widows as well? Well, um, let's move on to the, the next one. It's a larger section of Scripture in James chapter 1. I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. James chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. He says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, You stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But, you've dis but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, 
you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Here's the next thing. If we want to treat people right, we should avoid favoritism and discrimination. Favoritism, doing you know, special things for people or treating them more favorably, or discrimination and, and treating them as lesser than because of situations. Um, I don't, if I were to ask you a question, how do you respond? I, who's somebody famous that you've ever met? Have you ever met anybody famous? And when you met them, how did you respond? It's interesting, over the course of my lifetime, I've had a chance to meet um, some fairly famous people, um, you know, and um, mostly athletes. I, I remember being in Indianapolis and met Larry Bird and Spud Webb and Ron Harper and, and Dominic Wilkins, rode up an elevator with some of those guys, you know, and I turned to them and I said, hey, good game. They're like, thanks, you know, and I was trying to figure out any way to strike up a conversation. A few years ago, I went actually um, with a couple of buddies, went back to, um, to Canton to um, the the Hall of Fame inductions and saw Tim Brown, that's the jersey that I'm wearing today, uh, went back there to see him get inducted. And while I was there, I had a chance to meet Marcus Allen, which is, you know, so cool. And so I met him and I'm trying to be cool and carry on a conversation. And I'm like, hey, I said, you know, came all the way back here to see Tim Brown and you are one of my two favorite players, Tim Brown and you. And, um, and, and I was just kind of overwhelmed by him a little bit, you know, and and, um, and he said, thanks a lot. He said, where'd you come from? I said, well, actually, I'm living in Bakersfield right now. And he said, oh, I've been through there. I'm like, cool. And we put my arms around him like we're best buddies and took a picture and, and um, got that picture in my office. And, and I don't know what the deal is with people that are famous or whatever. You try and be cool, but at the same time, it's like, it's hard. You know, just something you instinctively knows that there's somehow something different about this person, at least we think there is. And I think sometimes when it comes to favoritism and discrimination, I don't know that we intentionally try and treat people differently, but somehow, because we see them or value them differently, we just automatically respond differently. And sometimes we don't even notice how differently we treat people. And, um, and James says here that, that you must not show favoritism. And he warns against discrimination. In fact, James says that if we show favoritism, we're breaking the law that says we should love our neighbor as ourself. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when he says, you know, that we shouldn't show favoritism, he's not saying it's wrong to have favorite people or that somehow all of our relationships should look exactly the same. I don't think that's even reasonable. And for that matter, Jesus had, you know, large numbers of people that followed him as disciples. Then he had the 12 and then he had the three that were even closer. And then he had John, the beloved disciple. And so there were tears of intimacy, um, even with Jesus. And so, so take some of the pressure off when we feel like somehow we have to treat everybody and everything's got to be exactly the same. I don't know that's even fair or reasonable. But I think the key is, um, is what the word favoritism mean, means. And um, the word favoritism comes from combining two words. The first part meaning receive and the second part meaning face. Receive, face. And what it means is to receive somebody just on what you see on face value. We even use that phrase face value. Just what we see on the surface. You know, and, and so we receive them based on what we see on the surface and nothing of, of any greater significance. And um, like I said, we use that phrase face value to just be looking at the surface. He says we need to be careful about treating people better or lesser than just because of what we see or know on the surface because there's so much more going on. And I think the key is where he says we should not give them special attention. And he speaks specifically about those who are wealthy, but I think we probably can discriminate and show favoritism in a lot of other ways as well. But to not show special attention. Now I was thinking about that. And while we're not supposed to provide certain privileges or treatment to others that we wouldn't also give to others. I do think we need to treat all people, you know, give them all people the kind of attention that makes them feel special. So even if we're not giving special attention, we need to give people the kind of attention that makes everybody feel special. And, and so, so um, I think that's the key here as we look at this. And we need to be careful about giving people special attention just because they meet certain criteria that we happen to value. And I mentioned that James focuses in this passage specifically on those who are wealthy or those who are poor. And, um, and, and so we need to be careful about being dismissive to those who are 
poor just because we feel like they, they somehow don't have much to bring to the table. And we need to be careful about showing favoritism to those who have more wealth just because we think it'll help you know, further our cause. Or, you know, and for that matter, I was thinking about this a little bit. One is I think it, it's got to be really, really difficult to be wealthy or to be famous or have position or power because you never know if people are really interested in you for you. Um, I've known people like that. You know, living in Bakersfield, you have the Carr family, and, and I know there are a lot of people that are very genuine, but at the same time, I, I, I watch, I think, how do you ever know when somebody really cares about you for you? You know, and, and so we need to be careful about, you know, using people um, just because we feel like they bring something else, you know, in, into, into our, it will, that will help our cause. You know, um, the other thought I had when I was thinking about this, James was actually addressing an issue in the church. Not just that there's favoritism outside the church, but even in the church, there's favoritism, there's special treatment. And I, and I think that can still be an issue these days, is that we need to resist the temptation to, um, to treat people better or differently, or maybe sometimes even to cater those who have wealth, just because we're afraid that if they don't like what we're doing, they're going to pick up their ball and go. And I've been in the church, I've been pastoring long enough that I know that if you're in ministry long enough, at some point, there will come a crossroads where you'll have to choose between doing what God has called you to do or catering to those who have wealth or influence. And some of the most painful things in my life have been sometimes where we've done, you know, as a church, what we believe God has called us to do. But at the same time, it meant that people of, of means, you know, decided that they would move on. And, um, and, and so we need to be careful about, you know, treating people special just because they have wealth or not treating them special because they don't. You know, and, and even though James focuses specifically on favoritism and discrimination related to, to wealth, I was thinking about some of the areas. Sometimes people are provided favoritism or discrimination based on appearance. Uh, people who seem more attractive, there's all kinds of statistics and surveys and you know, kinds of experiments they've done to find that a lot of times people who are perceived as being more attractive, you know, end up with a lot more things than going their way than those who aren't considered that. You know, or sometimes appearance has to do with just the color of our skin, our ethnicity. And, um, and, and some people are, are given the benefit of the doubt or a leg up, you know, just because, you know, they fit a certain profile on other people. You know, there are all kinds of negative assumptions made as well, or they just don't get the benefit of the doubt discriminated on that based just solely on appearance. Age is another thing that sometimes are, people are discriminated about or we treat people differently. You know, those who are older dismiss those who are as younger as, as not being ready to really have a seat at the table. Perceive them as being irresponsible or a variety of other things. And sometimes those who are younger see those who are older as no longer being relevant or worth their time to listen to. You know, and one of the things I love about our church is it's really a cross-generational church. Um, but let me say this, it's not enough to just come and sit in the same vicinity or proximity of each other and, and then go on. Is Somewhere along the way, we need to be better about having conversation and communication and relationships that cross over a little bit more. I think we're friendly. I think we have a lot of people around, but I would love to see us to take that next step and, and for there to be more communication on any time we come together um, with the different groups. I loved, you know, when we were doing our family fun nights, you know, we'd come together and you just have these different, different, you know, age groups kind of connecting and being there together. And I think that's a really good and godly thing. Another thing that people are discriminated against or, or favoritism is gender. Sometimes gender determines whether someone gets the benefit of the doubt or has to work twice as hard for half the opportunity. Another would be status. If a person has power or position or even just popular, sometimes they get treated more favorably. And um, we need to be careful of all these things. In Romans chapter 2, verse 11, it says, God does not show favoritism. And so my thought is that if God doesn't show favoritism, then we shouldn't show favoritism as well. You know, if God doesn't show discrimination against us, no matter how broken, broken or messed up we might be, then we, we need to have that same mindset that God has as well when we respond to others. I want to go back to verses 8 to 9 just for the last point here this morning. If you really, it says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin 
and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Wow, that's a sin. Here's the next and last point, and it kind of sums up everything. If we want to treat people right, we should treat others how we'd like to be treated. If we want to treat people right, we just need to think about how we'd like to be treated and treat them the same way. Nobody wants to be discriminated against. Some of you listening have probably have had that happen at different points in your life for any kind of different reasons, just not given a chance. You know, somebody wrote you off or didn't invest in you to begin with. You know, and, and um, but there's others, you know, maybe you've done that to others and, or maybe you've been given the benefit of the doubt for a variety of different reasons. And, um, you know, Jesus was asked at one point, what's the most important command? And you remember what he said. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, Paul wrote, all the law is summed up in one sentence. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, we sometimes refer to this as the golden rule, and James calls it the royal law, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And it's so simple. But how different would things be if we actually did that? You see all this conflict and, and, and just the angst and the anger and the criticism and the judging and the harshness that's around right now, and how different it would be if we really spoke about people, spoke to people, treated people, you know, the way we would want to be dealt with. You know, and, and I'm convinced that if you, if you treat people the way you'd want to be treated, then you, there's a pretty good chance you'll be treating others right. Let me just add one other kind of, by the way, comment here. If you're looking for a little motivation, and there's all kinds of different motivations, but in verse 12, James goes on to say that we should speak and act as those who are going to be judged. We should speak and act like those who are going to be judged. And I know that someday we say, well, someday we'll be judged, but I believe that even we need to live every day that we're essentially being judged, being evaluated, you know, and by how we treat others. You know, do we love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and do we love others as we love ourselves? So here's three questions this morning just as we wrap this up. Three questions as we think about this. If, we, if we're going to stand before the Lord, three, three things we might want to ask ourselves. First of all, do I keep a tight rein on my tongue? Do I keep a tight rein on my tongue? Am I, am I critical of others? So this is a spirit of criticalness that, you know, and, and sometimes that criticalness is people are angry about the world and sometimes people are angry about the church, you know. And, but either way, we need to be careful that bitterness and, and, and all those, you know, horrible feelings don't well up in us. You know, and, and we need to be careful to keep a tight rein. That image of a tight rein is like a horse. You know, have you ever seen a horse gets out of control? You know how dangerous it can be. So we need to keep, keep a tight rein on our tongues. The second thing, do I go out of my way to care for orphans and widows? Do I go out of my way to care for orphans and widows? Now, I know that some of you do that for family members that fit that category. Um, but, you know, I, th I think within our church, we've got a lot of things covered, you know, and... and age groups and different things, and there are people that we need to care well for, you know, and just be there to encourage one another. Um, the third thing, do I treat all people in a way that makes them feel special? Do I treat all people in a way that makes them feel special? Uh, I remember um, when we were uh, youth pastoring, uh, youth pastoring, and we were looking at um, interviewing at a church, going to pastor church. Actually, we'd already been church planning. We were looking at going to a church in Bakersfield. And I remember um, my, my father-in-law said something really significant to my wife um, related to ministry that I thought was really interesting. He said, you know, I found in life that we, a lot of times we think we need to convince people that they should like us. And we need to spend more time just convincing people that we like them. Because if you convince people that you like them, they will like you. And I thought that's great. You know, a lot of times out of insecurity, we go around trying to sell people on why we're so cool and why they should like us. And the reality is, if we just genuinely and not, you know, not fake or false or, you know, but sincerely care about others and make them feel special, relationships will be there. They'll be drawn to us. Anyways, I want to close in prayer. And, um, and I do hope you have a great day. And I thank you for, for tuning in. Um, I think about that call to love one another. And I would just say this. Love is more than being neutral and not disliking other, or treating people badly. It's proactively investing in others. And, and a lot of times I think we're neutral towards people and we call it love. But the reality is, is that love is what Jesus did when he went to the cross 
and lay down his life for us. And, um, and, and we need to have that same kind of a, of, a, of a concept of love for others as well. Join me in prayer. Lord, we just thank you once again for your love for us. What an incredible example you set, and the bar is pretty high. And um, so, Lord, may we keep a tight rein on our tongues, and may we care well for those who can't care for themselves, and may we make others feel special, God, and not you know, treat people differently based on just what we see at face value. And, um, and, and so, God, we pray that we treat others the way not only that we want to be treated, but the way that you would want us to treat them as well. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. God bless you and have a great day and enjoy the Super Bowl. Thanks.